In the late 80s, I found myself at the peak of my addiction. The honeymoon phase of experimentation and partying was long over. All that remained was the endless cycle of maintenance and chasing the next high. Inevitably, it led me to a place where I was broke and homeless. That place was the Pine Barrens. Everyone from Jersey or the surrounding states knows it, but for those who don't, the Pine Barrens is an enormous stretch of forest over a million acres spanning southern New Jersey. Most of the land is protected, preserving a wilderness rich with wildlife and even richer with legends. The Pine Barrens was an ideal place for someone like me to be homeless, especially if you had the right survival skills and, in my case, warrants. There was enough forest to disappear into, enough space to keep moving your camp. For me, it was even better. I had a connection with the cook who'd set up a crank lab in a makeshift shed. Out there, a place just as perfect for hiding as it was for cooking. This was the darkest, lowest point of my life, and I won't sugarcoat it. I won't glorify the lifestyle I was living. There were no positive outlooks to share not even the ones I might have clung to back then. But even through it all, one thing stuck with me, the wilderness was beautiful. Even when I was strung out, barely functional, it was undeniable. As beautiful as the pine barrens were by day, they became something else entirely after dark. The forest felt less welcoming once night fell. When the darkness rolled in, so did the sense of trespassing. The forest seemed even more massive, endless. It was like a portal had opened, swallowing you whole. The place you thought you knew disappeared replaced by something else something darker. Like I said, I wasn't the only one squatting out there. I'd been in the area for just over half a year, but there were others who'd been out there much longer. They all followed the same rule, don't move around the barrens after nightfall. I wasn't originally from this area, so I wasn't familiar with the legends of the place. But it didn't take long for me to hear the story as of the tale of the lead's mother and her thirteenth child, the one she cursed praying it would be born a devil, and how something answered her plea. On the night of its birth, it flew out of her womb, up the chimney, and into the night sky a broken bar into the pine barrens. I remember the rhyme they used to say mother leads, cold and crass, begged for a curse that would last. Satan heard, dark and sly, and shaped a child from fire and sky. Born of shadow and dark design beware the devil of the pine. It seemed like everyone I met out there had a story about their encounter with the Jersey Devil. But as strung out as I was, even I wasn't high enough to buy into those tall tales and backwoods superstition. That is, until I did. It was nearing the end of September or October hard to say. My sense of time was warped back then but it was getting colder with the occasional frost creeping in at night and early mornings. I had been feeling the withdrawal hard for two days. My connection had been snatched up by the cops, and I hadn't been able to get my hands on anything since. I felt like complete crap. My body ached, I was so tired I could barely move. And by the second day, paranoia started to set in. A lot of people don't realize it. But the paranoia during withdrawal can be just as intense as when you're using. Night had fallen. And by then, it had been about three days since I'd used. I was beyond exhausted, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was too restless, too anxious. I couldn't stop thinking about my connection getting arrested. What if the cops came back out here? Or worse, what if he flipped on me? He knew I was wanted. What if he told them about me? I'd already moved my camp twice that day, each time deeper into the barrens. But the longer I sat, the more every rustle in the trees seemed like the cops closing in. So, I packed up and pushed further in, deeper than I'd ever been before. I didn't know exactly where I was anymore, and in that moment, it actually made me feel less anxious. My logic was simple. If I didn't know where I was, how could they? I cleared a patch of earth, set up my tent and built a small fire just big enough to give me some warmth but not so large that it would give away my location if someone was out here looking for me. I tried to rest, but sleep still wouldn't come. I sat by the fire for hours, watching the darkness stretch and sway just beyond the flickering light. The stillness and quiet were soothing, easing the grip of my anxiety. But then, I heard it the soft popping of twigs in the distance. Crunch, pop, crunch. Pop. It sounded high up, almost as if it were coming from the trees, not the ground. As paranoid as I was about the cops, 
I knew they weren't climbing up into the treetops. I tried to calm myself, telling myself it was probably a now Laura raccoon leaping from limb to limb, but the noise kept getting louder, closer. I could tell now that the sound wasn't from small creatures these limbs were huge, crashing to the ground with a violent thud. There was no way it was an owl or anything that small breaking those branches. Then came the sharp rapid crack and snap of multiple branches followed by a massive thud that vibrated through the ground beneath me. I jumped to my feet, body stiff, ready to run but unsure if I should. I had no idea what was actually happening. I stood frozen, mouth agape, exhaling clouds of breath into the cold night air. My body was rigid, every muscle tensed as I listened intently. The silence stretched on, until it finally outlasted my patience. I reached onto my bag, retrieved my flashlight and slowly crept away from the light of my camp and into the brush toward the noise. Moving through the forest, I lit my path in short bursts, covering the flashlight's tip with my hand to briefly reveal my surroundings before concealing it again, just enough to see where I was going without giving away my position. After about 20 meters, I reached a section of the forest where the ground was completely littered with massive branches. As I moved closer, I heard snorting. I froze dropping to one knee, trying to conceal myself until I could determine where the noise was coming from and, more importantly, what it belonged to. I aimed my flashlight, uncovered the beam, and made a quick, jerking scan from side to side. All I saw were scattered branches and the trunks of trees. Shifting my weight, I turned to face a different direction and scanned again. The beam cut through the darkness, and amidst the browns and blacks of the forest, a massive white shape emerged. I quickly covered my light and held my breath. I couldn't tell exactly what I had seen, but it was massive. Tancing my body into a crouched ball, I prepared to spring backward and run toward my camp. Then the creature began to snort, exhaling puffs of breath into the cold air. There was something oddly familiar about the sounds it made strange, but not threatening. As I listened, a sense of calm washed over me, recognizing the noises. I slowly stood, fully exposed. I uncovered the flashlight completely, letting its beam fully illuminate the creature before me. The light cut through the darkness, revealing the massive white figure before me. My suspicions were correct. Standing in the middle of the woods was a huge white horse. Its back turned to me, facing the opposite direction. I let out a sigh of relief at first but it was short-lived. The longer I looked, the more I questioned why it was here. Its tail and mane were tangled with leaves and broken twigs. As I stood there, pondering its presence, the horse slowly turned its head toward me. My breath caught in my throat. Its eyes weren't reflecting the light they were glowing, an eerie, unmistakable red. The horse exploded into motion, rearing back onto its hind legs and letting out a piercing, neighing cry. Then, with a thunderous crash, it dropped onto its front legs and broke into a full speed charge straight at me. It barreled through the brush like a bulldozer, the stomping of hooves and snapping of branches loud and jarring. I leapt to the side, dodging the charge just in time as the massive animal thundered past me, missing by inches. As I hit the ground, landing hard on my side, my flashlight slipped from my grip. Its beam danced wildly through the air casting strange shapes and jagged lines into the darkness. I rolled quickly to my feet, scrambling to retrieve the flashlight, which had landed a few feet away. Snatching it up, I jerked the beam from side to side, searching for the horse. Nothing, just trees and empty space, the cold air marked by the puffs of my breath. Everything was still. Everything was silent. The horse was gone. Where did it go? It had been there just seconds ago. It felt as if this thing had charged straight past me and vanished into oblivion. The noise, the chaos it was all gone, replaced by an unsettling silence, as if it had never been there at all. At first, I thought it might be standing just a few feet away, hidden in the brush frozen and watching. But as I studied myself and scanned the area more carefully, there was no sign of the horse. Shaken, my anxiety churning inside me, I decided I'd had enough. I made my way back to camp, packed up my things, and started hiking toward the forest's edge, eager to put distance between me and whatever that was. As I began hiking out of the depths of the forest, my paranoia was overwhelming. I felt eyes on me 
watching from all directions. Every time I turned my head, I swore I caught the faintest movement but nothing was ever there. Amid the crunching of my footsteps, an unfamiliar sound caught my attention a whisping noise high above the canopy. It wasn't the wind there was no breeze. I raised my flashlight toward the treetops, the beams revealed something unnerving. The tops of a few trees were swaying gently, but only the ones directly above me. As I stood there, head tilted back, my flashlight's beam illuminating the treetops, the whisping sound returned louder this time. It was followed by the snapping and crashing of branches, the noise growing closer and closer. Something was coming, fast, but not from the ground it was moving through the treetops. Panic took over, and I turned to run. Whatever it was, it was too fast. In moments, it was directly overhead. Twigs and branches rained down on me, pelting my shoulders and head as the thing passed above. Ahead of me, a deafening crash broke through the stillness, followed by a tremor that rippled through the ground beneath my feet. I skidded to a halt mid-sprint, my chest heaving as I realized something warm was streaming down my face. Blood, probably from one of the branches that had hit me. I covered my flashlight and stood still, straining to listen. Running seemed like the obvious choice, but I couldn't risk blindly sprinting into this thing. My best chance was to figure out where it was first, but there was nothing, no sound. It the forest had fallen nearly silent. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, cold and exposed, every nerve on edge. The thought crept into my mind it could be just feet away, watching me. It could see me, but I couldn't see it. I felt this thing closing in on me and the air around me began to have weight to it as my chest heaved for every breath. Panic set in. I yanked my hand off the flashlight and swung the beam around, frantically scanning the trees for any sign of it. As my flashlight swept from trunk to trunk, my heart dropped. The beam landed on a massive, familiar white shape just meters ahead of me. The light illuminated the horse, but as it hit, the creature began to change. Its pristine white fur slowly darkened, turning blacker than the night itself until no trace of white remained. Its glowing blood-red eyes staring through me. Blood began to trickle down from the crown of its head as small, sharp pricks pushed through its skin. The points grew, extending farther and farther, until its head was covered with a massive, grotesque set of antlers. The creature's back began to shift, its hide tearing open in two jagged sheets of flesh. The skin peeled away, wrenching skyward, revealing a pair of monstrous, Eldritch wings. My mind was a blur. I had no words to describe the emotions surging through me, nor the places my consciousness spiraled to in the face of such a sight. It was otherworldly, something beyond my understanding and existence. I felt small, insignificant, and utterly irrelevant like mere fodder standing before this creature. And in one swift motion, it lunged at me, and everything went black. The first thing I remember was the murmur of the forest the familiar creaks of trees and the rustling of leaves then the light. I jolted upright, my body off the ground. It was daylight. I looked around, searching for the creature, but there was nothing. I was exactly where I had been the night before, flashlight now dead but still in my hand, and all my gear still on my back. There was only me, just me in the forest. No signs of the thing I'd seen. I stumbled wearily out of the pine barrens straight into town, and went directly to the police station, where I turned myself in for my outstanding warrants. I was so terrified by what I had seen that the only thing that brought any sense of safety back into my life was the thought that, if it wanted to get to me, it would have to come through a cell door first. I served my time, got clean off drugs, and put myself through college. Eventually, I earned a degree in library science and became a librarian not in Jersey. I've shared my encounter in the Pine Barrens with others, and I always say I have no idea if what I saw was actually real or just a weird, withdrawal-induced hallucination. All I know is that it looked real, felt real, and impacted me in real ways. I'd gone through withdrawals before, and never hallucinated, but I also know it's possible. But whether it was real or fake, it got me clean and turned my life around. Actual monster or drug-induced vision. I never want to see that much darkness and strangeness again. When you walk down evil and dark paths in life, you will always encounter evil and dark things. And I'd like to pose the question, 
Whether these horrors are grounded in reality or just figments of our imagination is there really a difference between them?